Саламатсыздар ма, құрметті достар. Біздің бүгін Шығыс Түркістандағы мәдениет пен адамдарының өміріне арналған фестивалімізде. Uh, of the online festival, it is available to many people around the world. You can mention our goals. Uh, goal of the festival, which is to our goal is to show what is happening in East Turkestan with the people living there. As well as and we want to reach as many people as possible with this information. We are one people, one people and we have, we similarities and we have, this have many fraternity and this is common knowledge between us. Hello everyone, my name is Bota and this is Zarina. We are uh, two of the organizers of the Zhangash Fikara Film Festival. As you might have heard, we had to quickly switch to an online format and I think I'll just add to what Zarina said that I think this format is more inclusive and it allows many people around the world to see us and all the links are available on our website and also available on our Instagram and highlights so you can watch any of the films at any time that is convenient for you. I'll briefly tell you about the plans for our second day of the festival. The program is going to be quite uh, busy. So first we will uh, give some introductory words, us as well as Rushana Bas. We have talked to her yesterday, but today we'll continue our discussion with her on the subject of the festival. After Rushana Bas, also at 3 p.m., we have a small lecture from an anthropologist and scientist, Rune Stenberg. And the subject of his lecture will be history of East Turkestan through the prism of cross-country migrations. This is going to be a very interesting lecture. Make sure to watch it. And you'll also be able to use the translation function in Zoom. So you can click on a button and you'll be able to hear the lecture in the language that is the most convenient for you. After Rune's lecture, lecture, we're going to stream online the film All Static and Noise. Since this is a festival film and this will be an exclusive showing, we won't be able to show the entire film, but we will show the most important parts of the film on our YouTube channel as well as our Zoom broadcast. After we watch All Static and Noise, there's going to be a Q&A session with the film's director, David Novak. David Novak will tell us more about the concentration camps in Xinjiang as well as some additional information about the filming of this film. It's going to be very interesting. Please connect to us through Zoom. Please connect to us on YouTube. Share your links. Share the links with your friends and relatives because our main goal, the festival's main goal, is to reach as many people as possible so that people find out about the stories of those who have been the victims of the concentration camps in China. Since this is a very delicate subject, we do understand that it might be difficult uh, morally difficult or emotionally difficult to watch these films. That's why you will have more time. You'll have seven days to watch the films whenever you feel like you are ready to watch them. And my personal advice would be to try and watch these films because, first of all, uh, this is something that you only have one chance to watch these films only this week, to watch as well as to discuss them. And perhaps Zarina would like to add anything? Yes, I wanted to add that actually these films are very important and our festival is not some sort of a competition that awards prizes to films 
говорим, что какой-то фильм лучше или нет. Or where we judge the films. Actually, the main goal of our festival is human rights. Is the violation of human rights in East Turkestan. And because, unfortunately, there's very little information available on this topic, that's why we wanted to share these unique documentary films with you. For example, not just documentaries, actually, because yesterday's film, Nika, was not a documentary. But these are films uh, on the topic of what's happening there. These films have interviews with the victim, victims of these camps who have been subject to violence that's been committed against them. Uh, it's about people who have disappeared, people who are right now imprisoned or who are in these concentration camps. Uh, this is a subject that we've been paying attention to for a long time and we wanted to share with you what's happening there. And I think uh, as in film and visual art, what's very important is you can see that these are people who are similar to us. You can see that these are people, our people, they're like our friends and family. They're peop they speak the same language as we speak, Uzgur, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, Kyrgyz languages, Kazakh. So we would like to share show through this festival that we're all part of one identity and I think this is a very important thing to pinpoint to underline I think it's also important to say that apart from the films that will be showing those who have been in concentration camps but there are also other works that uh, show the culture of East, East Turkestan of Uyghurs there you know, there are films that show the cultural traditions of the region and show that we're all united, that we're all friendly cultures. Because we all know that what's happening in China is a cultural genocide. And that's why I think it's important for us to understand that their culture, this culture is important and it should be heard not through stories about pressure and violence, but also through, you know, other kinds of stories that highlight their traditions and other cultural things. So right now we'll have Roshan Abbas, the co-founder of, uh, co -founder of Campaign for Uyghurs organization and a an, uh, human rights advocate. She has a film in search of my sister, but we couldn't show this film because this is a festival film and due to the rights issues, we were unable to show this film online. And of course, we're also unable to posted on YouTube. This film, In Search of My Sister, tells the story of Roshan Abbas, who's searching for her sister. She actually knows perfectly where she, her sister is in, in a concentration camp. And I think you'll be able to ask Roshan the questions that you have uh, through about her story, but you can also ask her any other questions that you might have about, you know, the culture and the traditions of Uyghurs and anything that you would like to find out. Right now we're giving the floor to Rafkat. Okay. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to tell to the audience again that we're uh, our guest is Roshan Abbas. She's the she's the founder and the leader of the campaign for Uyghurs Uyghur Human Rights Organization. And we're also joined by Abdul Hakim Idris, who is the director of the Center for Uyghur Studies. Uh, maybe you can tell a little bit about yourself, Abdul Hakim Akar, uh, for the audience. Good. Assalamu uh, alaikum, everyone. My name is Roshan Abbas, and uh, I have been living in the United States since 1989. I am originally Uyghur. I was born and raised and educated in Urumqi, the capital city of uh, East Turkestan. And the, uh, yeah, currently we live in Washington, D.C., and the, I'm the executive director of Campaign for Uyghurs. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Abdul Hakim Idris. Uh, I, was I was born, born in, in Oten in Istrikstan, uh, uh, not too far from here. Uh, I'm right now uh, Executive Director for Center for Your Studies, uh, which, which we uh, publish reports, articles, 
documentation, books, and uh, policy recommendation for decision makers. We are based in Washington, D.C. We have researchers around the world, including in Turkey, in Europe, uh, Canada, Australia. So that's, uh, I will end my back my here. Save the time. Thank you. Uh, I, just on a technical note, uh, if I may ask you to, when the second person speaks, maybe you turn off the microphone so that we don't okay. get a duplicate um, yeah. voice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, again, thank you for joining us. It's just such an honor for us. And I, I believe it, it will be great for the audience to hear you out. And maybe starting the discussion of the film, it tells the story Although it's called In Search of My Sister, it, it tells the story of many, many Uyghurs, including both of yours. Maybe can you elaborate what this film means personally to you um, in terms of your life, advocacy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rafkat, and uh, everyone who's involved in behind the scene who made this festival possible. Uh, the film In Search of My Sister captures the most uh, painful journey of our lives and one that continues to unfold it's not just a, it's not just a story of our family it represents the horrors faced by Uyghur Kazakh Kyrgyz Uzbek and all the Turkic communities in our Batan in our homeland today do you need to translate Rafkat? uh no we have okay, uh, simultaneous going. translation you can keep going yes oh I see Okay, so uh, we feel very privileged to have this opportunity and the protection to travel uh, this close to our homeland and the Uyghurs in diaspora yearn to be this close to our roots, our family, whom we cannot speak with and whose faith we know nothing about. Um, next week will mark the fifth year uh, anniversary of my sister, Dr. Gulshan Abbas's detention uh, he, she has been uh, detained unjustly. And the um, yeah, this uh, film, In Search of My Sister, talks about this journey. Yeah, and uh, uh, this film is uh, about, you know, my family too. Uh, because uh, I lost contact with my, my family 2017. Uh, last time I uh, spoke to my mom was 25th April 2017. As any uh, other, you know, boys or uh, I was so close to my mom. I did uh, talk to my dad so once a week, but uh, I was, you know, after this uh, new technology, you know, uh, Per Skype, I was able to call my mom every day. I think from 2010 to until uh, 2017, every day. And we have, you know, and, uh, our conversation never ended, you know. And I heard uh, some of, of my, at the time, my brother says, my mother was uh, waiting every day to talk to me. If I call her and talk to her, and I did, I made her day. You know, she was so happy. My my, my I was able to talk to my uh, son. So uh, when I uh, when when my mother uh, said, you know, don't call me because uh, she saw uh, my brothers were taken, and mm -hmm. my sister was were taken, and their kids were separated, and even in our in our home. Uh, was a Chinese person, a Han Chinese person, an atheist, uh, was in our home. Our family uh, were, you know, uh, was forced to serve this family and they become slave in own home for this, you know, uh, uh, peoples. So uh, as, as you know, uh, maybe you heard Chinese on state media reported 1.1 million Han Chinese cadres put uh, the Uyghur families. Imagine that what, what's the Uyghur home? Uyghur Uy. Uy is, you know, mm -hmm. like a madrasa, as a, like a school, as a, some place, you know, free from 
uh, oppression from outside the home. You will teach your kids morale, manner, akhlaq, traditions, and you know, you live your own. And this is, you know, like a turning 1.1 million Uyghur Uyghurs families to prison in own homes. This is plus more than 3 million people in concentration camps and the over a million we were in the Kazakh and the Uzbek and the Tajik youth girls transported to inner China for work as slavery and they separated more than a million children, you know, from Uyghurs, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, Tajik, Tatar, Turkic people and the, uh, from, taken away from the family. So m my mom was, you know, like a uh, she has very strong personality. Uh, she, she, uh, the, uh, my parents were able to come to Germany 2001. And we talked long, you know, and she said, uh, my son, you know, that is like an, our way to talk, you know. Uh, I had enough to eat. Uh, I, uh, you know what, what she says? Yedirinimni uh, yedim. Keydirinimni keydim. Kürdirinimni kürdim. Balam sen. Erkillik için yolunda devam kaldı. Yani mm -hmm. I had enough from life. You know, I get my my part. You know, to eat, to see, to live. Uh, it's already you know. You go your ways. So like a strong woman, and she uh, said, you know, uh, don't call me. That was like a, you know, like a come a bomb or stone on my head. So I waited, you know, days, months, almost a, a years later. My wife, Rushan, saw me, how I was, you know, like a normally I'm very happy uh, person, you know. I, I talk, I laugh, I make jokes, you know. I, I, I'm so easygoing, you know. So, But one year was like, a, you know, more than 10 years for me because I was, you know, my, my, my thought was there at home, you know, what happened mm -hmm. to them. So then uh, Rushan... As, uh, spoke in uh, Hudson Institute, uh, outlining my family situation, the old uh, situation in Turkestan, which we called Qizil Qiyamet. And I wrote a book, you know, in Turkish, we call this Qizil Qiyamet, in English, menace uh, of Chinese colonization of Islamic world and Uyghur genocides. And even I wrote, you know, uh, that uh, three years later, an uh, open letter to my mom, and I, I describing the situation there. So, and then uh, Chinese Communist government, you know, after Russian spoke about my family, they took my sister-in-law and the Russian sister, Dr. Gulshan Abbas, as a hostage. And I, I, uh, I had the opportunity to see Dr. Gulshan Abbas in uh, Washington. Uh, she visited us. What, what, mm -hmm. what can I say? You know. She is like a very quiet woman. She uh, she cannot hurt hurt a, a flyer or anything. You know, she is like a, a with what we call in our language perishte melek. You know, she she is uh, if you talk, you know, if you say ten words, maybe the, she says, she gives you a smile. You know, like a, she never talk a lot, and she she is a doctor and she. Uh, speaks fluently uh, Chinese language and the worked at the hospitals. And she was, you know, very help, uh, helpful for those patients. They came, you know, not from Urimji, from around uh, East Turkestan, from village. Uh, she translated for them, gave them food, you know, care them, tech. So like a, uh, she is like a human being, you know, and she never uh, uh, wear a hijab or, you know, like a religious activities, not things, you know. And mm -hmm. this is clear. The Chinese Communist government took her as a hostage. So this film is, you know, started from there. Imagine, as, as a husband, you know, from Russia and for the Dr. Gugusha Abbas, I am responsible twice. Because uh, I sometimes, you know, I think uh, maybe Russia uh, keeps silent. Maybe she is still there, you know. But the situation is this, and this film uh, begins from there on and uh, exploiting, you know, uh, all situations, even given uh, to Chinese narrative enough time to explain that. that there is a the fact, leaked document, reports, testimonies from 
Kazakhs and the Uyghurs, you know, and the Uzbeks even. And uh, what 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 was happening there as a as a former camp survivor. So uh, I think in this film, uh, if you see this film, uh, you will get you know some some you know information. But it's uh, it's impossible to to write or you know uh, explain the 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 situation uh, what's going on there uh, in a film or in the words. Mm-hmm. It's unimaginable. So I will uh, end my 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 uh, talk right now, saying you know, uh, uh, I think two months ago we were in Frankfurt. We had uh, 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 opportunity to give a presentation to German uh, business scholars, journalists, people in Heidelberg. After our uh, presentation. I asked, you know, a German, like at the table, you know, I went there, said, oh, what you saw in this present- presentation, what's your exp- uh, you know, impression there? You know what they said? Chinese Communist government uh, did perfection. What the Nazis Germany did to Jews, what the Soviet, you know, uh, did in, in uh, Gulag, the Gulag, Gulags, right? Gulags, what you say? Yes. Gulag. Cool. And the, what the... Uh, uh, Imperial Japanese did in uh, Southeast Asia. This is like a combined perfection for the situation. That's it. This is the, uh, the the situation today, uh, still going on across the border here. Yeah, unfortunately, we have historical precedents of, as you mentioned, of the mass detention of people, of the mass persecution of people. We have. Multiple examples of genocides happening hap- that happened in, in the world, like last uh, last century, even this century, a few genocides happening in the world, and uh, it's sad that to realize that maybe humanity is not learning a lot from them, and sadly this time maybe Uyghurs have to be yet another example of the silence of the world, or maybe of how humanity is failing their people. Uh, this is unfortunate, given that we have the history. But I think Abdullah Kimaka, you mentioned. Uh, I mean, you had a. You said that that you blame yourself for uh, Rushana da, Miss Rushana Bas sister that she is detained because she spoke out. But I think it's important for us, and you probably both understand this, that you always blame yourself if you speak up. Maybe I'm speaking too much, but if you don't speak up, m- maybe I should have sp- spoken up, right? That's that's always, I think, a dilemma for activists and for the human rights defenders. But for both of you, I understand, and uh, you're you're saying all of this, and this really resonates with me because uh, my dad's cousin, uh, I think my my mom's cousins, are still in Xinjiang, uh, in East Turkestan, and we also received a message in 2016 or 2017 saying, "Stop calling us." I think I had to grow up to myself today and to understand what that really means. Now here you are in Kazakhstan, very close to the homeland. Is there anything like a special feeling that you're too close or maybe yet too far to the homeland and maybe yeah. maybe other yes. things? Yeah. Yes, you know, uh, when our flight, you know, uh, uh, get up and they're going to Kazakhstan, it is like, you know, I'm flying to home, but I cannot go there. And uh, when I uh, landed in Almaty, you know, I saw, because uh, we, we, you know, in Turkestan, we see Kazakhs, Uyghurs, other people, you know, Turkic people. And the same in Almaty, you know, like uh, I see, you know, uh, I can understand uh, if, uh, if I hear Kazakhs language, because I can, well, that's like a close to Uyghurs. And I, I saw many Uyghurs, some Russian or others. But, you know, like, uh, I think I'm in home, but not in home. And this, uh, our, our, our homeland is maybe three, 400 kilometer away or 200 kilometer away, uh, but we can not reach there. And I cannot, you know, uh, as I said, my, my father passed away, uh, you know, after six and a half year later, I get the news three months, uh, three, uh, three weeks ago, my father died in this year in January. Imagine after seven, eight months, you will get your father 
passed away, died. I, I don't know which day my father uh, died. If my father get, you know, Janaza Namaz, if my father, you know, buried like a Muslim, uh, if uh, where is my father died, I don't know, in hospital, in jail, mm -hmm. at home, was anybody there? Uh, how long, you know, the, 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 uh, that uh, body uh, was there? I don't know, you know, still don't, don't know. And the uh, as, as a son of a, a Muslim person, you know, the Uyghur or Kazakh, everybody, you know, and death is from Allah, we say, you know, you cannot uh, control it. But uh, as, a, as a son or daughter, you, you know, you give your last uh, responsibility, duty, you know, to go to the cemetery, make a dua, at least, you know, you see, I cannot do it. And, and it's, it's, it's a, as a person, I'm not only one. I think here, Many in this country and the Turkey, many people, same situation like me. But this problem is, you know, if you speak about this, they, uh, the, 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 they see, you know, that this communist regime works like a mafia style, you know. They punish your family, your classmates, your friends, you know. And you will think a thousand times. And there are few people, okay, they came out, uh, you know, uh, take the consequence, you know, uh, what this is. And uh, uh, is this. But I think, you know, I'm, I can imagine my parents, my mom, I don't know if she's alive or not, but uh, my father passed away. I think they will be very proud of me because they sent me to school, you know, get educated, you know. Be, be, be a fight for the justice, for freedom, for human dignity, you know. We are doing this, you know. Yes, and I think it's not easy for everybody, but if nobody do this, you know, fight for the justice, <laughs> freedom, democracy, human rights, like uh, for the dignity, and you will be voiced for the voiceless people, uh, this, this world will be looking very dark, you know. And uh, we are glad, you know, uh, uh, seeing you and your colleagues, and the trying to organize events, be a voice for the voiceless people. And it is, you know, this is the hope, you know. This is the, this is the, like, a show us we are not alone, you know. We are not forgotten. And, and there are some folks, you know, struggle to fight for the people. They cannot speak. They cannot stand up, you know. Hence, they have money. They have power but they don't have courage to come out, you know. They don't have, you know, enough courage, you know. Be, be, be you know, like, a, I live once, I will live free or die. This is the, 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 the principle, you know. I, I, I'm very uh, honored to get to know you guys and uh, uh, inspired by you. Thank you. I would like to just add a couple things while we are talking about uh, this topic. So everything my husband Abdul Hakim is saying here and the Beijing's ultra-nationalistic uh, genocidal policies combined with racism and advanced technology. And the, uh, all these have been confirmed by China's own leaked documents, experts, survivors, and also the UN Human Rights Commissioner's report. Uh, basically, they are confirming everything we are saying. So today, um, let us recognize the deep-rooted connection between the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs. Both of our communities share a Turkic origin. We are same people. We have a common history. And we have shared cultural heritage that uh, spans centuries. And in times of hardship, it's our duty as brothers and sisters to stand up uh, you know, for one another, and uh, which, uh, you know, my um, deep respect to you all, uh, to Zarina Rafkat and everybody and this uh, film festival and everyone working so hard. So, you know, and also this is like, you know, our Kazakh brothers and sisters back home have also faced the relentless oppression by the Chinese regime. Um, the Gulzira Al Khan, a Kazakh born in East Turkestan, endured imprisonment in uh, China's, you know, so-called uh, vocational camps. And her story is a reminder that this injustice extends beyond the borders, beyond just the you know people there affecting who, um, the, all the people who share our heritage. So I just want to uh, say one thing at the end. 
Benjamin Franklin once said, you know, quote, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. So, in unquote, um, so, you know, what you are doing actually is a step forward to end this injustice, end this genocide. And the Chinese Communist Party is a threat to the world democracy and the freedom of all people in different race and different religion in all over the world. So this is our only chance to confront this evil and hold um, China accountable. And the one way to do this is recognize it and hold Beijing accountable. So if we allow China to continue to control the world order and continue to manipulate all the countries, our leaders, the CCP's actions against our people will be a reality for entire world. So our future generations will bear the consequences of an illiberal world if we don't act now. Thank you. Yes. Um... Thank you, Mr. Shan Abbas, Mr. Abdul Hakim Idris, for, for joining us today and yesterday. We also met you here in Almaty for a, for a brief physical meeting. Uh, yeah. Maybe just for the last well, couple of moments, I, I wanted to ask you, you said that you came here to Almaty, you had this exposure to the Uyghur diaspora, and I think it's unique to, yeah. to the world the Uyghur diaspora that we have in Kazakhstan, it's the largest. I um, mean, you can, we can, we have Uyghur schools here. You can, you can have an experience of Uyghur theater. Um, maybe mm -hmm. just a couple moments, what you, what you felt being in this, being maybe back in this environment. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. Actually, we feel like we are back home because we are in right in the middle of this beautiful culture and the language and the arts. And we met and talked to Uyghur painters and they listened to the concert songs and the theaters and the stand-up comedians. So it is an amazing feeling. Um, we don't usually take any time off for ourselves because we have so much work to do. And we always just continue to raise awareness and advocate for our people. But our time here in uh, Almaty with the, uh, the Uyghur people here. And they um, even just uh, speaking to Kazakh people that uh, you know all the sympathy that they have toward the Uyghurs and the understanding, it's just amazing feeling. This is really refreshing. And uh, we did uh, uh, took a lot of energy and refilled ourselves with strings to fight onwards. Internet. Thank you. So do you have anything to add, Hakim? No, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, good luck so with much. the festival. And let's work together. Yes. Thank you. Let's... Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Ihtiram. Hurmat. Thank you. We are very thankful to Roshan Abbas and Abdul Hakim Idris who joined us and physically they were with us at the studio and in general they made this huge journey from America to visit our festival. Unfortunately we couldn't hold it in the format we initially planned but it was important for us that uh, their physical presence in Kazakhstan. I think we all noticed the effect of their presence. We would also like to thank all the media who have covered our story, our festival, and who have spoke out about the pressure that we've experienced. And I think maybe even owing to the fact that we couldn't conduct the festival uh, offline, this helped us kind of show more the pressure that we're feeling in East Turkestan. And now we'll have a break, and at 3 p.m. we would like to see you. We'll, you're welcome to see us again, where our guests, Runa Stenberg and Zarina Mukanova, 
uh, as a moderator will be talking next. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, now we are having our uh, guest speaker, another guest speaker, Rune Steinberg, Dr. Rune Steinberg. He is the researcher, social anthropologist, and has been working on uh, Uyghurs in Kashgar for many years. And at the moment, he is the one of the one of the persons uh, who are, and one of the researchers and activists actually who is working on the issues of. Uh, uh, human right violation in Xinjiang. So let us uh, let me give my uh, microphone to Rune. Pass my microphone to Rune, and we listen to his lecture dedicated to um, history of migration of Uyghurs in Central Asia and about the identity. I I I I, I guess. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks to the organizers for. First of all, for organizing this fantastic festival, I'm really, really happy that it has taken place and um, that you managed to set it up and make it even bigger again after last year, uh, which was already a great success. I hope it will continue many years in the future. Thank you also for inviting me. I'm very honored and happy to be here. Um, and I really look forward to watching all the films. Many of them I know already, but I would say all of them are so good that they're definitely worth watching more than once. Uh, there's a lot of depth there and there it's a really important topic. Um, I, as Zarina said, have myself been working on Uyghur issues and Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, also known as East Turkestan, since 2009. And since 2018, I've been documenting witness testimonies from people uh, who had been interned in the camps um, and in the whole uh, mass internment system built around the camps in this region starting um, actually as early as 2013 but really taking off uh, with a big mass internment campaign in 2017. I will in this uh, short uh, talk go back in history a little bit and look at both the region and uh, the uh, history of the people of the region in a historical perspective, I will be looking a bit at uh, border crossings um, and also at the political constellations that have made the human rights violations and the really terrible atrocities that we see, especially in East Turkestan, Xinjiang Autonomous Region, but also uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, but also around both Central Asia and beyond Central Asia in a lot of other uh, capacities as well. Um, yesterday, I spoke to a Kazakh from the northern part of um, East Turkestan who crossed the border illegally by foot. He was fleeing the repression. He was fleeing the um, human rights violations. He had himself been detained in camps several times. He had been tortured. He bore the marks of this torture, both on his body in the forms of scars and also on his mind in the form of trauma that you could clearly sense when you spoke to him because he had difficulties to concentrate. He had difficulties to remember certain things. And he said, as so many people I've talked to, that this was something that came about after he had been detained and after he had been tortured, beaten and interrogated in extremely violent ways. He was here in Kazakhstan, also sent to prison and actually held in a camp for a year because he crossed the border illegally. Uh, he's one of several people that have done so. Some of them have been able to go on to seek refuge, refuge in other countries. Some of them have gotten refugee status in Kazakhstan. All of them are struggling because with their status, it is difficult to find jobs. They cannot open bank accounts and so on and so forth. Now, this is a fairly new phenomena. The crossing of a border being something that's illegal, something that can be sanctioned with these kind of um, uh, bureaucratic sanctions 
uh, is a new thing. It's connected to state bureaucracies. It's connected to the development of states and nations as we understand them today. But this is not something that has been uh, central or um, characteristic of the region, nor of many other regions around the world for a very long time. It's actually a fairly new development. Of course, repression, domination, and the uh, exploitation and mistreatment of people is not a new development. We've seen this in Central Asian history for millennia and also across the world. But the very type of domination that we see today and that both the camps are an expression of, as well as the mistreatment of people who cross borders illegally around the globe, is something that has come into being with the development of a very certain type of social connection, a social um, development or a social uh, system um, that starts in the 1400s um, and that is called colonialism and that develops out of the colonial expansion of especially European powers at that time, but spreads across the world. And as we very well know today, not just European powers were colonial, also Asian powers were colonial. India and China are prime examples of that. Um, and we can argue, depending on how we define colonialism, that many other places have colonial tendencies as well. For the Uyghurs uh, and for East Turkestan, or what's today called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, the real colonial experience starts in 1759, when the Manchu Qing Empire conquers the region and subjects its population to different forms of indirect rule. This is what we call a domination colony. A domination colony is a colony where the colonial power doesn't move a lot of people in, but they control them through their own uh, systems, through their own elites. And in Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region, East Turkestan, uh, two different systems were introduced, the Beg system and the Jasak system, depending on how direct or indirect the rule was. During this time, people were fleeing suppression. They were going across the borders. They were crossing into Central Asia uh, that had not yet been colonized. I don't want to romanticize uh, Central Asia at that point. It was clearly also not a uh, a purely benevolent place and state, but it was a state, a place that hadn't come into touch with this colonial logic yet and the types of domination and suppression that are connected to that. This changed in the 19th century. Central Asia was colonized by the Russian Empire and uh, people were again fleeing across the borders, now often in the other direction. Um, we have records both between Almaty and Hulja or the Ili region in the north of East Turkestan and also in the southern part between the Fergana Valley and the Kashgar Valley of people moving back and forth across the borders, fleeing, uh, well, for millennia moving back and, uh, uh, back and forth as nomads uh, and as traders seeing eco seeking economic opportunity, also fleeing suppressions. But since the 19th century, or in uh, East Turkestan's case, since the 18th century, also fleeing across because they are fleeing colonial powers and colonial setups. Um, the region becomes part of the great game, which some of you might have heard of, which is a, a competition, a colonial competition between the British, the, the Russians and the Chinese um, uh, Manchu Empire. And actually uh, one of the first independent states that were created after colonization in East Turkestan, which is the Jakobek's regime uh, in the late 19th century, they reached out to the British to ask them for support. So reaching out to one colonial power in order to get support against another colonial power, also something that we see repeating itself throughout history. Um, they were not granted any real support. Um, and 
again in the 20th century, the first East Turkestani Republic established in Kashgar, uh, mainly by Uyghurs in 1933, also tried to reach out to the British um, and to other European powers to get support against the then Chinese Republic. Again, it was not granted or not on any scale that really helped them. So in 1949, with the takeover of the Communist Party, of all of what was then before the Chinese Republic, um, the situation changes. It is still a colonial. East Turkestan is still a colony and still colonized lands, but the type of colony changes. It changes from a dominant domination economy, uh, domination colony to a settler colony, which means that the Chinese start moving people into the region and start to take over land. The goal is to use the resources, to use the land, but also to find a place for surplus population of the own populations. We know examples of this from the Americas, uh, both South and North America, from Australia, from South Africa. These are all examples of settler colonies and East Turkestan, then called Xinjiang, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, becomes also a settler colony with all the violence, uh, the land grab, the exploitation, um, and so on and so forth that goes with it. So from 1949, we have um, movements of people away from East Turkestan, fleeing the, this new type of regime. Um, and this continues up until 1962, when the border between the People's Republic of China and then Soviet Union is uh, blocked. A lot of the Uyghurs today living in Central Asia came across the border either in the 19th century, end of the 19th century, or between the 1930s and the 1960s, up until 1962. Then there is a long period where the border is closed, and now we are in a technology regime of states and of border control, where it's not so easy to cross the border if you don't have uh, permission to it. As I saw yesterday, and as we know, some people still do it, some people are still able to, but these mass movements across the borders are stopped by a state technology and military technology that doesn't allow for that any longer. So in the following years, as a settler colony, East Turkestan, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region goes through different phases. There is a very strong suppression phase called, we call it the radical decades, with the great leap forward in which millions of people across China die of starvation because of the mismanagement, economic mismanagement of Maoist uh, China. Then there is a, the Cultural Revolution that also is a part of this radical, these radical decades. There is a, a slight easing up in the 1980s. What Uyghur scholar Esed Suleiman calls a Uyghur renaissance of Uyghur culture and uh, also universities in which you have Uyghur from actually from first grade or kindergarten all the way up to university graduation um, and a lot of things that you didn't have before. That doesn't mean that the suppression stops, but it means that it changes nature and there's more of a push into economic integration, uh, political um, um, adaption. And uh, this changes again in the 1990s. In the 1990s, we have a stronger repressive phase after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, a lot of Chinese politicians are worried that the Uyghurs will also desire independence. Some do for good reason, uh, um, but this is clamped down upon very harshly. And in the 2000s, we go through a phase that is maybe less politically problematic, but again now as a settler colony has a very strong focus on the exploitative part. In the 2000s, in the name of modernization and development, and this is often the narrative in which colonizers try to legitimize why they should take the land and why they should take the resources of the people they colonize, um, 
the Chinese bring in Eastern Chinese companies, bring in a lot of resources from the Chinese mainland in order to develop, they say, East Turkestan or Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. But in fact, it is also to control it, to bring it into their hands, to get the resources, the oil uh, and the land of this very vast area. And they keep bringing a lot of Chinese migrants into the region. At the same time, the West launches its global war on terror. And under this mantelpiece, Islamophobia becomes rampant around the world and becomes a good excuse for clamping down on local populations all around the world. Uh, wars, attacks, suppressions, and the Chinese jump onto this bandwagon while at the same time profiting from becoming globalization's uh, global center of production and thus also global center of accumulation. This is all connected still to colonialism and to colonialism as a world system, as it expands and develops across the world. And it's very much connected to capitalism, which is a, a central part of colonialism and maybe probably one of its main drivers. And the capital accumulation that goes on in China is also connected to still its colonial endeavor of exploiting and suppressing places like Tibet, Inner Mongolia, uh, Yunnan, and of course also Xinjiang Autonomous Region, East Turkestan. So with a lot of this felt by the local population, while the wealth is rising in the region, so is the inequality, and it's a racialized inequality. Just like in so many colonial contexts, race, ethno-race becomes the, the criterion for saying who is advanced, who is backwards, who is developed, who needs development, and thus those who need development, it is okay to take away their livelihoods, take away their lands, and so on and so forth. And this is done over racial grounds. And so Uyghurs lose out very broadly, and so do Kazakhs in the north of the region. And this is felt as injustice, and people react to it. And there are different reactions to it, um, especially in 2009 in Urumqi, there are strong demonstrations against the government policies. They are triggered by the lynching of two Uyghurs in Southern China, where they were working under very precarious uh, circumstances producing toys, probably for the European market at a Chinese factory. Um, and they are killed because they are have, were accused of raping someone. It turns out that they hadn't and they were still killed. The Chinese government didn't stand up for them or give any kind of uh, justice to the situation. And this triggers protests in Urumqi, the Chinese government reacts to the protests through violence. And from that on, a lot of Uyghurs become even more alienated than they were before. This is a change in the colonial texture of East Turkestan, Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region. And we see different types of reactions by the local populations. We see the um, Chinese government clamping down on all of it extremely harshly and beyond what would be necessary in any measure of the word. And this leads to, in 2013, the first camps being built, the first people being detained for one or two weeks of political education, then the introduction of a so-called people's war on terror, which of course leans on the global war on terror, but now is focused on Xinjiang, especially on the Uyghurs, but also on the Kazakhs and on the Tatars and on the Kyrgyz and other populations in that region. The introduction of the so-called Fang Huiju policy, which is a policy of surveillance, grassroots surveillance, where Han Chinese cadre are moved into Uyghur and Kazakhs homes in order to 
live with them in order to teach them, but also to keep them under surveillance. And a lot of other forms of political indoctrination and humiliation. In 2017, this escalates into a wave of mass incarceration where hundreds of thousands of people are taken first to detention centers, afterwards into so-called re-education camps that to a very large degree function as prisons um, and also sent to prison, sentenced and sent to prisons themselves. We estimate that between 2017 and 2020, around 2 million people pass through these cap systems and of them, um, around 300,000 stay in the prison systems with sentences sometimes up to 15, 20 years. And some of the reasons when we hear them, we cannot relate to it at all. It sounds ridiculous. For instance, learning to read the Quran as a child back in the 80s has, has someone sentenced to 11 years in prison. Having uh, religious sermons at home on your computer gets someone sentenced to 15 years in prison. Uh, having contact to abroad or having crossed the border too often, here we're back to the border crossing thing, having used your passport too often gets you two years in camp uh, and so on and so forth. Really things that we, from an outside perspective, would see as very normal parts of cultural life are here criminalized and turned into reason for short or long-term detention. These are colonial measures. This is something we have seen in colonial history in other cases as well. It does so takes place in other places now to a degree like Palestine, like Kashmir, uh, like the Rohingya situation in Myanmar. But here we see it carried out by a high-tech state that has all the technology that it needs and is very scrupulous doing it on a very, very broad scale. Now, when I started looking into this, people were comparing it to the Cultural Revolution and people were comparing it to 1984. I think it's an interesting comparison to 1984, though I think that sometimes we miss the point of what it really what is the real similarity. Because, of course, there's the surveillance system, and this is what we know, Big Brother is watching you from 1984. Um, you could even say the Chinese surveillance system is more advanced than 1984, even imagine, because while Winston, the main character of 1984, has a corner of his house, of his apartment, where he can stand and not being watched by the screen, the surveillance camera, that kind of space doesn't really exist any longer in the total surveillance uh, uh, taking place in Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region, East Turkestan. But what is more interesting, I think, and more cruel in many ways, is the way that this type of surveillance and this type of pressure changes the social structure and changes people's psychological position. Because as in 1984, also in Xinjiang Autonomous Region, Uyghur Autonomous Region, East Turkestan, a lot of people are brought into the system. They are more or less forced to work for the system, it becomes a logic that they relate to. And I've heard descriptions of people standing in line to denounce their neighbors, because that is something that will help them politically. And it's something that gets very deep into the structure, both of culture and society, and of the individual. This is in part what we can call coloniality. Colonialism is a system and it's an ideology. A colony is a place, a land that has been colonized. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, the other Central Asian uh, regions are no longer colonies. Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, East Turkestan still is a colony, but all of them still bear the traces of colonialism and all of them have parts and elements of coloniality. It's a mindset, it's a way of relating to the state or not relating to the state. It's connected to an ideology and an epistemology, a, a way of viewing the world and of legitimizing. And for instance, the distinction between civilized and non-civilized, between modern 
and backward uh, and between, for instance, the different languages and what value they have, Russian, Kazakh, Chinese, Uyghur, and so on and so forth. These are traces of coloniality uh, that we all can find in ourselves and um, that in East Turkestan took, has taken and still take today these very, very violent expressions. Now, what I am really happy about is the solidarity that I see across the globe with the Uyghur cause. I would wish for more. I think sometimes there are certain connections that could be made that are not made. I think often it is connected to this idea of asking one uh, colonial power to stand up against another colonial power instead of creating solidarity between the people who are colonized um, and to see it in such a, a structural perspective rather than to see it in a nationalist perspective. But this is a long road and I think we are well on the way. I think this festival really contributes to uh, pushing uh, a very healthy and good perspective, solidarity, uh, cooperation, and to stand up not just against state violence, which I think is one of the really in the 21st century, one of the biggest uh, problems that we have, um, but also against the erasure of people's cultures, languages, and with them, the traces of colonialism, um, which is always violent, which takes different forms in different places of the world, and which right now in East Turkestan, Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region is contributing to um, erasing, moving towards erasing uh, what was once a very strong and still today is a very strong and blooming uh, Uyghur culture. And I think we all have a role to play in this. I think people all over Central Asia, but beyond that, all around the world uh, have a responsibility to stand up against this and to see it in the frame of a more general fight against colonialism, coloniality and the violent forces that come with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rune, for such an interesting lecture, such an interesting speech. I think uh, what you talk about, this is exactly what we needed, why it is happening right now in Eastern Turkestan. It is not, it, it didn't happen just all of a sudden. It passed for a long time and it was a kind of a preparation for this and all this colonial history. This is very important to know, actually, because here in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, uh, we are like in a post-Soviet countries. I mean, I wouldn't say post-Soviet, but uh, we are uh, actually talking about colonialism, meaning that it is a Russian colonialism. But when we're talking about the people in Eastern Turkestan, we're talking about different kind of uh, different colonialism, but not different kind of colonialism also. But the thing is what why we are actually launching this film festival and we are talking about this. It is that we are sharing the same identity, the same language, the same culture with the people who were just divided by the uh, by the borders by two colonies by two states by two uh, yeah by, by two colonies basically so families were separated our identity was separated and uh, we have broken broken families broken faiths and at the moment what is happening in 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 eastern turkestan it's it's heart touching i mean it's it's it, it's devastating actually but the, uh, do you think, I just have maybe, at the beginning, I just wanted to say, do you think that this is uh, might be um, that the fact that we are in a, a, in a, in a post-Soviet countries, uh, in, in post-Soviet Central Asia, we have lesser attention to what is going on in Eastern, Eastern Turkestan is actually direct results of the colonialism, of the Chinese colonialism and Russian colonialism. And how do you think uh, it interacts with the idea of intra-coloniality of the Central Asian people, if we're talking about the um, common identity? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I think that there are many reasons why the situation in East Turkestan has 
gained relatively little attention in Central Asia. And one of them, of course, being that people here are also under pressure and they are afraid of speaking out, not necessarily because they don't think it's terrible, but in part because they don't have the information, in part because they're also afraid of the sanctions that would hit them if they did. I also think, though, that you're right. It is a product of coloniality as a mindset to accept strong states, to accept the developmental states, to say that, well, you know, it's maybe there's some things that are not going so well, but generally it's a good thing to modernize, generally it's a good thing to develop and push ahead. And while we can say coloniality didn't just bring bad things, uh, it is a whole package that includes a lot of violence. And I think all of the good things that coloniality, in a sense, have brought, um, we are we use we use English right now to talk with each other, spread throughout the world, became the world language because of coloniality, but and you use Russian amongst yourselves here, but also a lot of the technolog technological advances could have been brought to us without coloniality and without colonialism. And I think this idea of standing up against it and its products and its results is something that really um, needs a solidarity movement from below and a global solidarity movement because this ideology and this idea is so widespread around the world. And so I think, yes, it does, it does derive from both Soviet and Russian colonialism, but also the grander uh, developments, the grander scheme that stands behind that. Thank you for your answer. I really uh, want to have to give you to ask you more questions because I really want to this this, this kind of discussions continue more but we have already discussed a lot between us and it's continuously discussion about what it is coloniality and how it is developing and affecting and about the good and bad sides but unfortunately we are short in time and i only was able to ask you one question unfortunately nobody asked uh questions so yeah but uh yeah thanks a lot uh and i think uh we uh, we're grateful that you uh, agreed to uh give us this speech and actually to show how uh, how it's actually happened why why we are having uh, such a problem and uh, such a um, such a devastating devastating uh, human right violation just very close to almaty actually not far away so thank you very much for coming and giving your time for dedicating your time for us and supporting us yeah we are close now we are having a break now yeah thanks a lot yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we are having yeah, we are having break for 10 minutes now. Thank you. Or not. No. Yes, we're having break for 10 minutes and then we are screening the film. All static and noise. I hope you will join for this film. Hi David, uh, Janice. It's good to meet you and uh, thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us on. Uh, we're still waiting for um yeah. we're still waiting for Aina to join the this discussion and then once she appears I think we can start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to also to take this moment to thank you again for you know for being so flexible with your film, with uh, yeah. with all the corrections that we had to do to the schedule and also to the format itself. So it's great that you uh, and as many, like most of the filmmakers, they they did um, understand, they did support us, and that's uh, we really appreciate your flexibility in this. Yeah, and you you've told us so many times that this is what you, I mean. We're working in the same field, we're working on the same plight and cause, and this is why we maybe need to support each other, right? Yes, ab absolutely. Uh, without without global solidarity on this. <laughs> Um, we're, we won't be able to make much progress. And, and I think the strength of, of everybody all over the world who are involved in this issue, the, the strength of combining forces is tremendous. Yeah, um, I've seen the film and I also done the subtitling for the film uh, mm -hmm. to Russian, from English to Russian. And I had to go through all of this. And I, when you watch the film in such a great detail, you understand 
how much work was put in it put in it there were so many locations filmed so I understand that of of that global solidarity you may have felt um during the process of of shooting the film mm. Well, and yeah, it's a shame that your viewers couldn't watch the whole thing, but it, what was important was to convey the content from Kazakhstan. And certainly Aina, who will be coming on shortly, I'm sure, um, was a big part of that. And and I wonder if we shouldn't just get started. Maybe David could describe, you know, the background on uh, how he came to Kazakhstan. Because, I, you know, and then we can add Aina when she comes. Yeah, I think we, we can do that. We we can start. I think David, if you could tell, I mean, this this would be a great entry point to the conversation. Tell us how you, yeah, this about this. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I I had already begun um, along with Janice and with the help of some other researchers researching the 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 issue and what was going on. And through a, a lot of reading of um, some stories that were coming out in a few short news pieces, um, I, I saw, I, I learned about the involvement of the Kazakh people and that there had been some interviews of people who had recently come out of camps um, in Kazakhstan. And so um, similarly, that was right around the time when interviews had, had first come out of Istanbul uh, with Uyghurs who were living in Istanbul. And so I decided at that time that um, I would do a, a, a filming trip that would involve both countries. And so we went to Istanbul first uh, for about six days of shooting and went from there directly to Almaty, uh, where Aina met with us. And she she really um, just opened the floodgates of, of people who wanted to come out and testify, people who wanted to be heard. Um, in some cases, just a few cases, it was people who had been in camps. Um, in most cases, it was people who were testifying about their missing family members um, and also shedding a lot of light for us on the on what had been a porous border, right, for many Kazakhs where um, I didn't quite understand before meeting with Aina, I had not understood um, just how porous that border was and just how there were families um, on both sides of that border uh, and how there were people with residence permits, um, you know, with citizenship from one country and a residence mm -hmm. permit in the other, uh, because in, in, in a way, the sort of nationalization of these of these borders is is obviously very artificial. Right. And this goes back to the colonial conversation that you were having in, in the screening before the conversation about colonialism, which was, you know, a fascinating perspective through which to look mm -hmm. at all of this. Um, so with that, I, I I arrived in the very good hands of Aina in Almaty. Um, hi, Aina. I'm so happy to see you online. Um, hi, and welcome. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> and, um, and it was really she who coordinated uh, all of our efforts while we were there. Aina, thank you for joining us. And uh, we we appreciate your involvement in the film and then you're willing to join the conversation. David was telling us about his experience of uh, doing the interviews and um, filming in Kazakhstan. Maybe you can tell us more a bit from your perspective how it went. Maybe some share some shed some light on the challenges you experienced during the during the process. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to see you, <laughs> David, Janice, uh, and all the participants. Yeah. Uh, very sad that uh, we're not offline, uh, but maybe next time, I hope, uh, we will uh, meet all offline. Uh, yeah, the, during uh, the time in 2019, as uh, David said, yeah, uh, uh, there were difficulties, so-called difficulties, <laughs> struggles, uh, and uh, even yeah, following uh, on the winter road from Taldikurgan to Almaty will show. Thank you, David, in the film. Uh, yeah, it's it's a memory <laughs> for me, for you, and uh, uh, maybe uh, for the uh, rest of audience uh, just to know how we are working. But uh, for us, it's routine. 
just recently when uh, we uh, were uh, on the way to East Kazakhstan, again, the uh, car accident organized against us mm -hmm. to stop us and to prevent our visits to the victims in East Kazakhstan, but unsuccessfully, we always have three additional plans. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, my my advice to organizers is to, to have always uh, two, three additional plans and additional places, spaces uh, to conduct the festival. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, uh, despite its uh, this uh, struggles, uh, persecution, uh, uh, scaring, uh, uh, it's the routine for us. But when I saw it uh, from outside on the screen, and the stories of, of the people suffered, of divided families, of victims of torture, it's uh, heartbreaking. And uh, now the, I'm thinking how how we're working every day uh, with uh, all uh, these things. Uh, I remember uh, our colleague from Amnesty International said me the same. How you are working? It's so it's so hard. Uh, so he, he even said, "You're my hero <laughs> when uh, we prevented the suicide." Uh, for one of the victims, ethnic Uyghur, by the way. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, for human rights defenders, uh, obviously uh, the situation in Xinjiang and in, uh, uh, East Turkestan uh, is uh, the, the crime against humanity. And all the uh, biggest, largest human rights organization uh, already um, uh, expressed this position and of course we as human rights defenders we are on the same position. This situation mass human rights violations are crime against humanity and genocide of Turkic people, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, uh, Uzbek, Kyrgyz uh, and even not Turkic, Tajiks uh, is a genocide of ethnic minorities, of the people mm -hmm. who became ethnic minorities. They are not ethnic minorities on own homeland. Uyghurs and Kazakhs, they were not uh, ethnic minorities uh, because they are living there for centuries. This is their homeland. But in result of the policy of sinification, they became ethnic minorities on the own land. And it's terrible. It shouldn't be in the 21st century. Uh, the history showed uh, that uh, any uh, such crimes against humanity, uh, they uh, should be resulted in a process like, like New, uh, Nuremberg process. And for uh, Turkic people of Xinjiang, for Uyghurs, Kazakhs, uh, other Turkic people suffered uh, in own homeland in East Turkestan, there should be the justice. And this is our requirement. Uh, it's it's not just a wish. Uh, it's a requirement of suffering people. And uh, the international audience, I think, should hear uh, the voice of tortured suffering people. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I thank you for this, for these comments, for these remarks. And I think following up on this, uh, about the importance of bringing the voice of Uyghurs, of Kazakhs sent into concentration camps and just living under this, this constant oppression. The film's, the film's doing great work and, and probably is one of the missions of the film to get to the wider audience. So given the specificity of the topic and given that this, as one of the journals coined it, an unpopular topic, what are the struggles <laughs> you're facing or maybe festivals are embracing you in terms of, you know, Sp spreading the news, reaching the different audiences and platforms for this? Uh, for our struggles are that uh, this is a very sensitive issue for the all Central Asian countries and not only Kazakhstan, especially for Kazakhstan because uh, we have a one border 
between our countries, between Kazakhstan and China. Uh, we have uh, ethnic Kazakhs in uh, Xinjiang, uh, and uh, um, the people of Kazakhstan uh, is required to protect uh, relatives, uh, or the families of uh, the, the members of divided families, uh, to protect them. And uh, in six uh, years uh, since we started in 2017 to work, to protect uh, uh, repatriates and ethnic Uyghurs from Xinjiang and Kazakhstan, uh, we uh, referred uh, the, the claims to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan about uh, 500 people. And uh, I can definitely say that more than half of them were successfully resulted by uh, releasing the people in prison uh, in concentration camps by uh, returning confiscated passports and uh, allowing them to move to Kazakhstan. And we met uh, uh, them here uh, with these uh, people saved uh, by this uh, action, by this advocacy campaign. And uh, uh, we uh, noted that uh, especially uh, the ex detainees their first need uh, was the medical assistance. And despite we are the lawyers, we are not the doctors, but we, in 2018, we started uh, the medical assistance program for the victims of torture uh, from the camps. And we are still working on this. And uh, during these years, we are already provided uh, medical, uh, psychological and financial assistance to about 80 ex-detainees. And uh, the... Uh, uh, their family members. Uh, it's behind the war, the the legal assistance to the members of divided families. It's another work, legal work. So we we were forced to organize medical, psychological, and financial assistance. Uh, and so is... there are a lot of yeah <laughs> difficulties, but in general we see the results. Yeah. And this is the main issue for us. And with the regard with regard to the film, I mean, we see we see two different types of censorship out in the world. Um, we see the kind of censorship that that this festival has faced, um, which is pressure being put upon venues or festivals or whomever um, from from outside or from above mm -hmm. um, to to not go into these difficult stories that um, that some regimes don't want to be heard, um, and. We face a kind of a self-censorship that happens um, unilaterally across the globe, and I think just largely because of cultural and economic ties uh, to China. And I'll give you I'll give you a quick example. If some big film festival in, in Europe is considering showing this film, they have to ask themselves a very clear question, which is, are we willing to take the risk to show this film? and have China then boycott us, have the Chinese government boycott us as a festival and no longer permit their artists, their filmmakers to attend these festivals, to show their works. And, and that's a difficult question for film festivals. And I think it's a difficult question in terms of, uh, of the arts and the relationship between the arts and diplomacy in a way, because we want Chinese artists, we want artistic exchange. Um, we we want to that that seems to be the art seems to be the last space where healthy dialogue can happen before everything else shuts down. You know, and so it's a very difficult question for film festivals in particular. And we do know um, that there have been festivals that have strongly considered the film and have declined to show it ultimately. Um, and we know that these pressures exist. That being said, um, there are those who stand out, right? I mean, your festival is a festival that's obviously devoted to the issue. And I know you're going to find a way to screen <laughs> these films live and seeing them packaged together. I mean, I was just, it, it, it's extraordinary actually. It's really extraordinary having these all together. Um, and because it gives you even more of the breadth, right, of not only what's happening, but various perspectives on it, both both large and small. Um, and I 
And I know that we will be able to give your audience a full stream of the full film. What they saw was only a short excerpt of the film, uh, three excerpts that, that we chose um, because we can't stream the whole thing at the moment due to some other constraints that we have. Um, but in short time, we'll be able to make it available to the Kazakh audience in its full length. And um, there are festivals like, for instance, the Bergen Film Festival, the Bergen International Film Festival in Norway has stepped up. Um, they have a human rights section and we will be mm -hmm. premiering the film there. Uh, it'll be the European premiere in a few weeks. Uh, that's on October 19th. And um, we had our world premiere at a festival in New Zealand called Doc Edge, which was also willing to step up and has shown controversial works in the past, controversial in the sense that they have shown works um, that, that uh, some authorities would not be happy about, uh, works that have faced censorship in other places. Um, or cancel culture has attacked in one way or another in other places. Uh, so we know that the 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 um, there are those out there. There are festivals out there initially um, who are willing to show this material. And outside of that, then we're we're shortly closing a deal with a with a distributor, a, a, uh, an international documentary distributor who are going to help us get the film to various television markets, lots of festivals, things along those lines. Um, and Janice, I don't know if you may wish to to add anything that I'm leaving out about our 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 drive and our ability mm -hmm. to 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 get the film out there in spite of the op obstacles that exist. Yeah, I, I would only add that um, we also have been invited to a Muslim film festival in Australia, um, Perth, Melbourne and Sydney, which is great. And I think like your festival, you, know, you have an audience that's um, primed and ready to see this kind of content. And that's the approach we're taking. It's similar. I did a lot of arts programming in China and you're just always looking for the, the crack where you can get in. You know, it's the obstacles are there and you just grow to expect that. I, I have to admit, though, I didn't expect as that we'd find as many obstacles outside of China as we are. Um, so that's just interesting for me. And I think reflective of the environment we live in. Censorship is not only occurring inside the mainland, but it is the uh, I guess China's reach stretches far. Um, but we do. We look for the places. And I think we all do that in the work we do if you're engaged in human rights issues at large. You're just looking for the places where where there is a crack and you go with that. And then we hope that that will spread. And that speaks to one reason why we chose, um, obviously we were going to show the Kazakh section, mm -hmm. but I wanted your audiences and these excerpts that we could show, I wanted them to see um, the European Parliament give the Sakharov Prize um, to, to a, a Uyghur scholar. Uh, who is in prison, Ilan Toti. And um, I think that that's important for audiences to see because those cracks do exist. And even though the European Parliament is within that colonial structure <laughs> that your former guest was talking about, um, that um, it, it it shows the, the amazing reach that not only the film is ultimately making to, to one group of people who need to hear what's going on, but the reach that the activists, the Uyghur and Kazakh activists, people who are speaking up, and there some of them are activists in the form of just marching and protesting, but a lot of them are, they're researchers, they're artists, they're finding various ways um, to, to get the story out and to reach different pockets. And that, that the story of Ilam Toti has been been raised all the way up to where the European Parliament would grant their largest human rights prize um, to him, says a lot about the size of the audience that is out there, not just for the film, I just mean the size of the audience that's out there waiting to hear more details about the story, waiting to understand it more deeply and waiting to figure out how they can take part in finding a solution. Uh, audience members is asking, I asked the question that actually I already wasted, but I, I wanted to, uh, to, to, to tell you that the, this member of the audience is actually thanking you for, even though we're not able to watch the full, so full story, the full mm -hmm. film, 
they are very thankful for you sharing for sharing this uh, 20, 20, 25 minutes excerpt from the film. And I think following on that, it would be appropriate to ask for me. So you, you've, you've chosen a few excerpts from the film that you think would be the most suitable for the for, for Kazakhstani, for, for our audience. But it, mo maybe more broadly, and maybe touching Kazakhstan as well, what is the kind of impact that you expect to get, you know, mm. by showing this film? That, that also speaks, I think, could speak to the drive behind you working on this film. Like, what is your maybe... What do you expect? Yeah, I think that, that's um, it's a rude way to put it, but I think it, it can convey the, my idea. Yeah, well, let me start a little bit with, um, and then I'll pass it on to Janice. Sort of the, for me, the the drive behind the film um, comes from my own family's history. Um, I'm Jewish and I am of Eastern European descent and many members of my family died in concentration camps or survived concentration camps and came out to live a life of, of buried trauma. Um, and I felt um, as soon as I really learned about this and started talking with people um, through Janice and through people who we were working with, I, I, I felt compelled to, to um, tell this story to the world, to, in, in, in the voices of Uyghurs and Kazakhs, not in the voices of some American person, but in, in the voices of the people we meet in the film, um, to, 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 to give a, a, a megaphone, right, um, to the world and shout out that this is going on and how horrible it is in a way that my people were not able to do in the 1930s, because we didn't have mass media in that way. And the control of the media was, 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 was much tighter, actually, in those days. Um, and uh, you know, we have this expression when we refer to the the Holocaust in in Europe uh, in the in the 30s and 40s. We have this expression that ne never again. This should never ever happen again, and that that expression is meant to mean for everybody. Yeah, not just for the Jewish people, but for anybody. This kind of this kind of of horrific genocide um, just shouldn't exist on the planet. And the structures, the international structures that were put in place after World War II were meant largely to prevent that kind of thing from happening and happening again. So this is a fundamental motivation for why um, I'm engaged as a director in this issue uh, and why my, my filmmaking as an activist uh, in human rights has taken on this issue as something to, to get out into the world. Um, Janice, maybe you want to pick up on, on the rest well, of it. Well, I could just speak to the issue of goals. And I think ultimately we want what everyone wants, that uh, Uyghur, Kazakh, um, Kyrgyz, all those living in um, East Turkestan can live freely. And those family members living outside can be in free contact with their families. We want to just you know, open that world up. But I think at the very least uh, is we want people to just be curious and understand, because I do believe and I think it, we all working on this film believe if people understand what is truly going on, they would not tolerate it. They would speak up. So, um, yeah. And, and that's the function of film. That's the function of media, raise awareness. And I think David has, um, which it's not evident from this, but he's the man behind the sound in the film as well. And I think the film packs some beautiful, you know, effective visuals, uh, cinematography, but also sound that moves people emotionally in ways that uh, the, you know, t media short blips on CNN or wherever can't quite do. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to move people who don't know about the issue. There's a whole collection of, you know, China watchers and, um, uh, Central Asian watchers who are well aware of what's going on and are doing the kind of work um, that uh, is responding to the activists who are petitioning in parliaments and governments. But we want to ignite a fire in those people who are not aware of this issue. And I just give you one anecdote. I was working with a translator in Kazakhstan um, who came to me outside the rights network. And when she was reading the transcripts, this was new news to her. So people even within Kazakhstan, you know, there was uh, a room for growth. So even in the process of, of our work, 
we have engaged and raised awareness and hopefully are making an impact. Thank you. Yeah, from the standpoint of filmmaking and also from standpoint of human rights defending and just delivering the story, this is a very powerful film. And I hope that, I mean, I had the unique, I had the privilege to watch this film in full and I hope the audience in Kazakhstan will 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 have that experience as well. And hopefully maybe at the end of the discussion, I'll ask again about when it will be available on YouTube. But before that, you mentioned the the issue of trauma of people. And while filming the film, you met a lot of pe people with a very deep, although very recent trauma. And I understand it may be difficult to film the film, you know, asking the questions. So there's a, there's a lot of ethical dilemmas maybe going on and can you elaborate maybe on how you navigated through this ethical issue of maybe exposing too much and harming the people but maybe and versus not you know asking not really you know discovering or exploring the issue mm -hmm. well maybe it ties with the question that's in the chat right now about engaging local people like when we were filming wherever turkey kazakhstan the united states we were always navigating with a local partner. So at least you're moving with the community um, through Kazakh and, and Uyghur circles. Um, and yes, Uyghur and Kazakhs were involved in the making of the film behind the scenes. But um, uh, David, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, there were, first, there were many Uyghurs and Kazakhs helping, um, in, including, for instance, Aina, <laughs> uh, who, who was helping with our travels in Kazakhstan, um, not only with the travels, but with the who, the access to people, right, which is a major part of, of producing. I know, Aina, you didn't realize you were producing a, a, a section of the film. <laughs> um, and... Um, but we also have um, footage from Uyghur filmmakers. Um, we have a uh, Johar Ilham has been has been involved and engaged with the film since the very beginning. Um, Abdueli, who is who you see in the excerpts briefly talking with her, Abdueli Ayub, who's now in Norway. He um, he he did a similar kind of work as Aina when we were out in the field. But then he also helped with finding poetry for us and all, all kinds of things along those lines. We have a composer who, although he isn't Uyghur, he is very involved um, with Uyghur music and had spent a lot of time in East Turkestan in the in the Uyghur Autonomous Region. And he, um, so he's very, very well versed at the, at the music. Um, and so we have a lot of Uyghur instrumentation in our music as well. Um, and I'm sure some of it is probably the same instruments that one might call Kazakh, traditional Kazakh instruments. I'm not sure. Um, and I'm sure I, I'm missing lots of people um, who who were involved in the film and helped us in many different ways uh, from the communities. Um, in terms of trauma, you know, it, it's it's very hard as a director to uh, sit in front of people testifying to traumatic uh, to traumatic things that have happened to them um, because I'm I, I I'm I feel very very deeply for them in the moment. Um, and I'm also concerned as to whether or not uh, revisiting this trauma is is good for them or not. Um, it's true that most trauma therapists believe that revisiting trauma in a healthy way is a very, very important release. Uh, having the moment to express is a very important release, but I can't know for sure that that's the case for every individual um, in the moment. Um, but the people who speak to us are absolutely resolute about telling their stories. That's that's why they're there. They they need to do it. They want to do it, and they have decided to to overcome whatever obstacles might prevent them from doing so. Some physical and some emotional, and um, I think that says a lot about um, how how that testimony, how that testifying um, may be healing. And I'd say uh, probably 20 times people have expressed to us at the end of an interview um, how much better they feel having talked. Um, and so I think that that's very powerful. We also it, face the... Oh, go ahead, Janice. No, yeah. I was just going to add that one of my motivations for even making the film was um was healing 
I'm a, um, in a former life, I was a, a therapist and I worked on the, on a project with the Holocaust survivors. It was the Shoah project and interviewed 60 survivors. Um, it was on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of liberation. And I met these people late in their life. And they told oftentimes for the first time they were telling their stories. And I thought this is, you know, here they had lived a whole adult life post-war. They had a good 50 years in there. And wouldn't it have been wonderful to have released this earlier? So I, th I was watching what was happening with the, um, the uh, concentration camps and the Uyghur situation um, in mainland China and thought, you know, this could be film will be a wonderful advocacy tool and a, um, you know, a vehicle for getting the word out, but it also would just be healing for those engaged, just as David has talked about, the cathartic effect of telling story. Because then there's something that happens emotionally when you're able to release the trauma and put it into place. And now it's created a form and it's as though, all right, you know, the form will take care of it and now people can hear it. And that's some, some relief for the, for the individual. Yeah, thank you. This is this is very good, and it really um, resonates with with me, and I believe with most of our team. Because last year, when we decided to go with a film festival, um, of course, it's not we're not um, we're a different kind of film festival, I would say. And one of the important parts for us was also maybe important missions for us was also a healing, and just you know being in a room collectively watching the film together, experiences the emotions. It's not the same as testifying or telling their, the, the, your own story, but maybe it's also about watching mm -hmm. someone telling what they went through and, and you uh, being compassionate with them. And then after the film festival, we had um, every day for five days, we had this collective discussions also for the sake of mm -hmm. collective healing. And for this mm -hmm. part, and uh, for this year, we, we were expecting to have a broader reach and also for members of the Uyghur diaspora to participate because I thought this would be a very good collective experience of watching the films together, of speaking to the directors and the human rights defenders, and you know, experience going through this experience together. Like for example, for myself, I started only I started telling the story of my uh, aunt only this year because I think only now I realized how personal this is to me. Uh, we haven't contacted uh, my dad's cousin for for like six years since they ask us not to text them or not to call them. Now, only now I think I truly understand what this means to us, to our family. And, how, and I think it's just because also because of the experience of, um, of us making the festival. There is a question in the Q&A uh, of Victoria Tulenima. She's saying it's not a question, but I thought about one more fest that could be potentially interested in demonstrating all static and noise is Art Dog Fest of Vitaly Mansky, director from Russia, who now is based on one of the Baltic states. From my experience in Freedom House, I know that activists and academics from Baltic states are looking for more info about Turkic, Turkic minorities in Xinjiang. Yes, and thank you. That's a that's a that's a great reminder for me. Actually, my last film, uh, Finding Babel, screened at his festival when he could still have it in Moscow. That was in maybe twenty sixteen uh -huh. or twenty seventeen. Um, he's pretty great, Mansky. He 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 does very 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 interesting, uh, groundbreaking work. And I um I will reach out to him. I think that I think that I had looked at it earlier in the year, um, and the timing of the festival was off for our release. But I think that maybe early next year we should be able to, to hopefully place it there. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you. There is also a question to Aina Shurmanbayeva. It's asking that you said in the film that there is all this. There is a sur surveillance uh, frequently, and also during the speech, you mentioned that. How does it reflect on your work? And do you have the, you know, this urge maybe to to drop everything, to give up, and uh, mm -hmm. maybe to, to live your own life? What does what is what is it that that keeps you in in this human rights work, and like what makes you continue fighting and doing your job again and again and every day? Uh, I answered in Russian uh, in, in the chat, uh, uh, but uh, I can repeat my answer. 
So I, I'm working in this field of human rights more than 20 years. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, uh, what I like, it, what uh, my, my soul wants. And uh, for me, so surveillance, uh, it's uh, like a negative side. Uh, uh, everything has positive and negative side. It's a negative side of our work. Uh, and uh, uh, the only uh, thing to prevent uh, the scurrying or giving up is uh, just uh, to work openly. They have nothing to hide. Uh, everything will be this uh, because uh, 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 this question, uh, it's um, yeah, very often people ask me, uh, mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what inspired you in your uh, work, dangerous work. So it's what what my soul wants. So it's, it's my work. <laughs> uh, and uh, we are working openly, we have nothing to fight, to hide, and uh, um, this is uh, uh, the best way of the surveillance and uh, all these negative things, uh, sides of our work. Uh, and I, I, I want to just um, part of feedback, uh, not really follow up on the, one of the stories of the testimonies uh, uh, given in, in, in uh, the film. So if you remember, uh, there was a, a couple uh, talked about their daughter's student daughter, uh, who was yeah, uh, uh, stopped uh, in the Beijing airport just before uh, the flight. Uh, to Almaty. So uh, uh, I need to say that she she's in Kazakhstan with her family. We sent number of letters to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to return her, and uh, finally she's at home. Of course, she needs psychological assistance, but she's at home with her family. It's very good to hear, actually. Thank you. You know, always watching the films about the survivors, the people who are in the camps. At the end of the film, maybe a few years after, you're thinking, what is happening with those people? It's good that some of the stories end well and have a happy ending. I would like to thank you, David, Janice, and Aina for participating in this and joining us, giving your film, and also participating in the discussion. Maybe uh, for for the last couple of minutes, your last message may be to the directors, producers, human rights defenders that you want, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I know we have uh, people from cinematography sphere in Kazakhstan joining our festival. I think it would be great to hear some encouragement, maybe words from you. Well, as an artist, I, I would say um, there is, to me, nothing more valuable than applying your art, your talent, your skills to human rights issues. And um, so I applaud your listeners who are who, who, who are in the arts in any way, shape or form, who are even here or are already displaying their interest in working in those areas. Maybe some already do. Um, um, I hope so. And maybe some are, are thinking are thinking about it because um, art has an incredible way of reaching people. Um, differently than news, differently than the printed word and differently than news. And so um, I'm thrilled to hear that there are some some Kazakh DPs uh, uh, attending the festival and and listening to to our talks. And it, it, it's not easy, you know, I mean, funding isn't easy. Uh, things cost money to get done. Um, you know, productions fall apart, just like film festivals get suddenly censored in the last <laughs> moment. So... <laughs> Um, that's something that we we all have to live with in in documentary filmmaking and and I and I encourage people to 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 look to um to more sort of scripted work uh, based on this issue uh, which has a whole different kind of an audience than a documentary and a, and a very different structure and a very different type of mm -hmm. appeal. Uh, so I I encourage everybody all over the world really to to apply their apply their art and apply their talents um, in the area of human rights. I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. We're one world and we're one people with a lot of diversity and a lot of differences, uh, but we have to all have each other's backs. 
if you want me to go next as a producer, I would say um, you just keep working it. And you're always inspired by the stories that you um, are given the privilege of sharing. And um, the motivation has to come from there. It has to come from a place of heart and a place of love because the world, it, obviously, as you all have seen with the festival, there'll always be the walls that you hit and the stopping blocks. So you just find the cracks and keep moving. Uh, thank you, David, Janice, uh, and uh, Jangashikara uh, 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 team for organizing uh, this uh, online for a while <laughs> meeting and discussion. Uh, uh, for, for me as human rights defender, it's very important. Your, your human rights report is the best illustration of our work. In many cases, especially on human issue, it's a very sensitive issue we cannot say openly about the victims, about their situations, because uh, uh, their relatives remained in Xinjiang as hostages. And uh, uh, there is a big risk for them and for their relatives there. Uh, when uh, they say openly what happened. Uh, and and for us, it's very important when people see uh, uh, in the reality how we're working, what we're doing, uh, and, uh, and the real stories of the people, how they suffer. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for your, uh, the whole team for this great work. Yes, and on behalf of the team, I would like to say our thanks to you, and we really appreciate your your presence, your flexibility, and your, your giving us the film to show to the local audience. We'll be waiting for the YouTube release of the All Static and Noise, or at least some release for the general public. Maybe mm -hmm. you can reach out, reach out to us, and we can convey this message to the to our audience so that more people can see all static and nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Our festival is about to end. We'd like to thank everyone who's been a part of our festival. As our audience members, as people who have provided their films, their spaces. Also, I'd like to thank our team who have been working non-stop for several months. I think as a team, we've done important work and everyone who's been involved in this, in the desire to tell these stories, we're thankful to all of them. I also like to remind you that tomorrow is our third and last day of our online festival. So tomorrow is the last day and it will continue in the same format, the same time, we'll start at 2 p.m. We're going to, going to have two lectures and discussions. The first one will be a discussion with a Uyghur scientist from London, Aziz Aysa, Aziz Aysalkun, which will start at 2 p.m. And then at 3 p.m. we'll have a discussion with the, with the directors of a film, Rachel Harris and Mukadas. So if you have a time, please watch the film Otuzokul. This film tells a story of people uh, who in Kazakhstan as part of Uyghur diaspora, diaspora is trying to save their traditions. It also shows how these traditions are also changing. This is one of the aspects, but this is an interesting story of telling how people are trying to conserve their traditions in the context of what's happening with their homeland, with their homeland. And Aziz Aysa will share his own story as well as his film called Phone Your Mother. And this is a story of Aysa of how he's unable to phone his parents. And this and how he, like Abdul Hakim Idris, found out about the death of his parents through the phone and he never had the chance to visit the graves or to uh, read a prayer at the graves uh, of his parents. That's about it. Unfortunately, we are unable to hold our public discussions that were initially planned. Tomorrow we will continue and we hope that you will participate. If it's possible, at the end, we'll hold this public discussion session, uh, a collective reflective session. 
like I like I've mentioned before, it's about healing, some sort of a healing that we can have co collectively by discussing and by understanding ourselves. Thank you all. See you tomorrow and goodbye.